Hello and welcome to my channel. I'm Hannah. I'm the mom of two wonderful daughters, one who has a rare genetic disorder. Here is where I'll be sharing some of my experiences, the things that I've learned and what life kind of looks like as the mother of a disabled child. If that sounds interesting to you and you'd like to join in on the journey, please hit that subscribe button below. In this video, I'll be talking about infantile spasms, what they are, some of the ways that they can look and some of the reasons that they might happen. Spasms weren't the first sign that our daughter was atypical, but along with her developmental delays and her low muscle tone, it did point to something more serious underlying. I think the key to identifying spasms is knowing some of the ways that they can look. So I will be sharing some of my daughter's episodes later on in the video with a heads up before I do for anyone who wishes to skip. Before I get into the video, I want to be very clear. I am not a medical professional. My aim with this video is to spread awareness, to share some of my experiences and some of the knowledge that I've gained. If you are concerned in any way with your child's development or that they may be having seizures, please take them to a healthcare professional and have them checked. So what are infantile spasms? Infantile spasms are a kind of epilepsy. They're very short seizures, one or two seconds. They usually appear in the first 12 months of life, which is why they're kind of known as infantile spasms. Although they can appear a little bit later they can also be known as epileptic spasms or West syndrome. Our daughter started when she was 10 months old. Our daughter also had a lot of the other characteristics that typically accompany infantile spasms, such as developmental delays, a regression before the spasm started, and a chaotic brainwave pattern, sometimes described as hypsarrhythmia. Early diagnosis and treatment of spasms is so very important. They can be very destructive to a child's brain development and just just like in our daughter's case, they can point to an underlying cause that needs ongoing support. So how do infantile spasms look? I'll give you some brief descriptions of how they look as well as how my daughter's looked before I share any videos and I will give you a heads up before that happens. In our daughter's case, her infantile spasms started as drop attacks. I often describe this as looking like a puppet that's had its strings abruptly cut. They kind of drop forward. They were so quick at the start, less than a second, but because they were so dramatic, thankfully, they were very hard for us to miss. Even without any experience with epilepsy, I was worried that they were seizures, so we took her to the GP the same afternoon that they appeared. We were told that it was normal, playful behavior for a child of her age. Even after we explained her developmental delays and low muscle tone, we were assured that it wasn't seizures because she wasn't losing consciousness and she generally wasn't bothered by them. This is just another reason I feel it's so important to spread awareness about what infantile spasms are. I'd love to hear if you've had any experience with this. If you're willing, please share it in the comments below. The most classic presentation of spasms is a sort of jolting of the arms and sometimes the legs forwards or upwards. Our daughter developed this type after a change in medications and these were also the type that relapsed. Often spasms will just look like a little jolt or a little startle, a flinch, roll of the eyes. Since they can last a second or even less, they can be really easy to miss. As they go on untreated or uncontrolled, they can progress. They can become more frequent. A child may start losing skills. They might stop smiling. They might stop laughing making eye contact, maybe even ignore you altogether. It can be very tiring to their little bodies and very harmful to their brain development. I'll be showing some of my daughter's spasms now, so skip to the timestamp below if you'd like to give it a miss. I'll start with the drop attacks. I'll play the clips a few times because they are very short and it can be really hard to miss them. This is a clip of the more classic presentation of spasms. As they went on uncontrolled, they did get a little bit more involved. Her eyes started to roll, her legs started to stiffen, her mouth started to clench as well during spasms, and she'd do lip smacking in between.
Infantile spasms usually come in clusters. For example, a cluster may be twice a day in the morning and before an afternoon nap for about 10 minutes with a spasm occurring every few seconds. Our daughters in particular were around when she would have breakfast first thing in the morning and in the afternoon just before her last nap of the day. As the frequency increased, our daughter didn't really have any defining pattern. They just happened whenever she was awake. Sometimes in the beginning, you may only see one cluster and sometimes you may have days where you don't see any at all. But as they go on, like in our daughter's case, they can have up to hundreds a day. The longer they go on, the worse it impacts their development. So how do they diagnose infantile spasms? If you suspect your child is having spasms, take videos. Make sure you get the body, the limbs, the face, the eyes if you can. Try and get what happens before and after. Try and move your child in the middle of what you suspect is a cluster. If it seizures, the behavior won't stop no matter what position that they're in. In Australia, infantile spasms are considered an emergency. So take the videos, straight to the emergency department with your child. My experience with the diagnosis will be very specific to Australia, perhaps even specific to the city that I live in and the particular hospital that I took my child into. As soon as we arrived to emergency, they stuck my daughter on an EEG. This is a fun test where they stick wires to specific parts of the head with conductive gel. It smells very bad and it's very hard to get out of hair. This is a picture of my daughter <laughs> with goop all through her hair. I described what was happening and showed them the videos that I'd taken. They asked me questions about my daughter's normal behavior to establish a kind of baseline and to see if anything had changed. They asked me if she'd had any sicknesses recently and if she'd lost any skills or any other regression had happened. They might also ask about some medical history, about your child's development, about the birth history, any genetic disorders that run in the family, or any other relevant family history. Once the EEG confirmed hip arrhythmia, we were admitted to hospital. The process will depend on your country and your situation, but my advice to anybody is to always pack an overnight bag with a few essentials whenever you go to the emergency department. So what can you expect in the future? Once infantile spasms are confirmed, the journey to treating them begins. Treatments, again, will depend on your country, your situation, and the particular hospital you visit, maybe even your neurologist's preferences. In most cases, first-line treatment is steroid. In the US, I believe this is in the form of injections. Here in Australia, it's in the form of a high-dose prednisolone. Another first-line treatment is Vigabatrin, and it's not uncommon to see both of these used at the same time. In our daughter's case, she was started on Vigabatrin, and when it didn't work fast enough, a high-dose prednisolone was added in. There's great success with these, but unfortunately, there are no ideal treatments for spasms and there's no guarantee that they will work 100% of the time for everybody. My daughter couldn't stay on Vigabatrin as the long-term treatment, which is usually the first preference. So some of the other treatments that we've tried are sodium valproate, which I believe is the first line treatment in Japan. We've also tried topiramate, which is another anti-epileptic, clonazepam, which is a different class of drug, high dose vitamin B6, and IVIG. There's lots of evidence to suggest that a ketogenic diet can work wonders for spasms, as well as other kinds of neurodivergencies. We're currently on a four to one ratio. There are so many medications, so many that I haven't even heard of, let alone tried. Please leave a comment below and let me know what has or hasn't worked for you. If infantile spasms are found and treated quickly, there's a very high chance of good outcomes and very little cognitive impact, especially if they can't find an underlying cause. But this changes if the spasms go on with an irregular EEG for more than three weeks. Poor outcomes can include continued seizures and epilepsy, developmental issues, and autism. Once our daughter's infantile spasms were diagnosed, genetic testing was started. This could include basic genetic and metabolic tests or more advanced tests such as the whole exome sequence. For the whole exome sequence, they require a blood sample from your child, the mother, and the father. There are many reasons why infantile spasms can occur. Sometimes an infection or a brain injury can be the cause malformations of the head or brain, like microcephaly or TSC, some metabolic disorders, such as hyperglycemia or a vitamin B12 deficiency, and of course, genetics can cause them, a well-known one being Down syndrome, or in our daughter's case, she has a rare SCN2A mutation. Sometimes they can't find any reason for spasms at all. You might hear that called idiopathic or cryptogenic. This isn't a bad thing to discover. No known reason can lead to better outcomes, especially if the 
infant tar spasms are caught and treated early. I hope you found this video interesting. Some important things to remember are to take videos. Make sure you get the face and limbs in the video and cut it down so that you're not scrolling through a whole bunch of footage. Make notes of when, of how many, how your child is acting before and after. If you suspect your child is having infantile spasms or seizures, please seek medical help immediately. In Australia, infantile spasms are considered an emergency. Don't feel guilty heading to your hospital emergency department and advocating for your child. I have included some links to information on infantile spasms below, as well as a link to a helpful Facebook group. The group has a supportive and friendly community. If you're not in a situation where you can head to the hospital immediately, it can be helpful to share your videos for a second opinion from families who have a lot of experience with infantile spasms. They can reassure you or they can let you know and encourage you to go to the hospital. You are not alone in your concerns and on your journey. If you found this video interesting, please hit that thumbs up. I'll be making more videos to spread awareness and to share my experiences, including what it's like to raise a daughter with a rare genetic disorder. So if you're curious about what atypical life is like, hit that subscribe button and the notification bell below.